Okay. You get your clickers ready. We're going to do some clicker questions. Uh, last time we uh, finished the day uh, talking about, we started talking about the moons of the outer planets. And there's about 170 of them. And, uh, but then we had to dismiss, so we're, we're going to talk some more about the moons, especially uh, one that I think is pretty interesting, uh, a moon called Enceladus, which I think we took a look at earlier last week. And uh, it's one of the moons of Saturn. You can study any of the moons out there, and they're pretty much all pr really interesting. So we'll, we'll focus on that one. And in, along the way, we'll talk about Saturn a little bit more. And then hopefully we'll get to talk about the ice giants, uh, as the textbook terms them, Uranus and Neptune. We have homework four. It's going to activate at 1030 this morning. I already set it up. But before we do any of that, I want to make... Um, a reinforcement to you that Thursday night is uh, a scheduled open house that you all can go to if you can squeeze it into your schedule and get your you-know-what up to campus uh, and get out there and observe. If you've already gone once, go again. You get another four bonus points. All right. And if you can't make it, you can't make it. In fact, nobody might make it if the weather collapses. Uh, eight bonus points, yeah. Ooh, that says plus four. Yeah, eight bonus points. Um, however, one of my top secret sources who will remain nameless, but not faceless, uh, just told me that uh, it's actually green for Thursday. So hopefully uh, you guys will go. And they're asking for volunteers and stuff, so they're expecting to go. And this close, um, there's a good shot that their prediction will be uh, on the mark. Question? Yeah, you get every time you go, you get bonus points. Because you know why? Because I want you to get your you-know-what out there. And uh, I want you to get your eyeballs out there and observe. Because... Just looking through a, a real good telescope uh, for the first time, uh, you learn a lot. Just you know, seeing, actually seeing all this jazz that we're talking about. So, oh, if you're a volunteer out there, no, you have to join the the UCF Astronomical Society. But you get more. You get you don't get bonus points, but you get the reward of knowing that you've helped. But you know. But, you know, the other thing is, uh, those guys are up there all the time, and as soon as they get the telescope fixed, they do a lot of uh, observations up there. And uh, so it's a good outfit to join. Anyway, so hopefully that'll be a good uh, session. And remember, if you cannot make it at any time, like you work off campus out in by the attractions or something every afternoon until 9 o'clock at night, which I know some of you, you know, have stuff like that, obligations. Uh, we'll have some other uh, uh, bonus point opportunities so that you'll be able to, and those will be four point bonus opportunities. And so you'll at least be able to get the equivalent of one uh, session, maybe two sessions, depending on how many uh, bonus opportunities you uh, take advantage of. So uh, questions about any of that stuff? Yeah. That's not about this, about the observatory. Yeah. Well, you do the full set of observations. What do they have? Four or five yeah, stations. Like four telescopes or something. So you hit each one, and then you, and then you talk to your friends, and then and then. But very important, um, you um, turn in the observation sheet at the observatory. You don't bring it into me. If, if you bring it into me, it's the equivalent of me going like this and tearing it up because you have, that's the procedure. And then they'll get it, the, your guys' stuff to me and, and then you'll get the points eventually. Last time it was pretty quick. Another question about the observatory. Yes? 
The question is, do they have observation sheets there for us? The answer is Y-E-S, yes. And although you got to be ready because sometimes they, they have run out in the past, but if you get there on time, you should be good. And then, so they'll hand it out. You'll put, you know, the, uh, your lecturer, that's me, and then the section number, and then the date and your name. You've got to put your name on it, of course. And then you'll turn it in. And then all your observations on the front and the back. And then um, turn it in to the, to the, um, the guys that are running it. So, Jenny might, are you going to go? Maybe. Jenny might be there, so, so she can give you the inside scoop. One more question. I don't know, what is the schedule? 7.30 or 8? Yeah. As that, long as you don't show up at like eight fifteen. Yeah, or nine. Eight fifteen or nine, like don't show up last minute. Yeah. They're not it's not like they're gonna kick you out if you yeah. you know it's kind of it's not if you're house, so reasonably time. you know, on time. Okay, now uh you had a um question about the exam coming up next Tuesday. Well, we're, we're going to be talking about chapter 11 and 12 today. So, and we've, the th uh, I think we've had some chapter 7 stuff uh, about Earth, and I have some comments about it today. So, um, but you know, the thing is, you, your study, uh, your lecture notes um, are your study guide, and from your study guide lecture notes, you can piece together. And, you know, looking at the free textbook and the search function and everything, you can piece together the chapters, but I, you know, that we've, we've talked about. So it's mostly solar system stuff since the last exam. All right, so let's get back to the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And I know as a public service, I'm going to say something that, it embarrasses me a lot. And that is the number of wise acres that take the third planet on this little list here and make jokes about it. And they think that, oh man, nobody's ever come up with this. But if you, you know, if you're... Anyways, the pronounce, if you're in Greece, the pronunciation would be Urano. Anybody here from Greece or speak Greek? Okay, it would be, because I don't want to be contradicted, but I think it's pronounced Uranos. And the, the last, the last, so U.S. is, is kind of an Angl is, is anglicization of that Greek word. Uh, Uranos, the, uh, the, uh, the father of the Titans in Greek mythology. It means the sky, heavens, and, uh, the, and male. And the the and you know what the the mother of the Titans Gaia, which is the word for Earth, and so the Titans, and then they have the clash of the Titans, and then they release the Kraken and all that stuff. Uh, but anyways, that's Uranus in Greek mythology, so that's how you say it. So don't make any wise remarks, or you'll tick me off. All right, I shouldn't have said that because now everybody's gonna make wise remarks. Anyways, uh, get your clickers ready. Uh, last time we had this clicker question. It's not a question today because we already asked it. We were talking about ammonia and how stinky and smelly it is. All right. And I told you that that is a, um, a colloquial or everyday description that we would apply to this substance ammonia. But ammonia is pretty important in the outer planets and actually in a lot of star systems. All right, so here's a question, and if you've done your reading, you'll know the answer to this. We know ammonia is pungent. For this reason, astronomers call it or is it nothing in particular? They don't have a special name for ammonia. Okay, 15 seconds. 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Click. Okay. Uh, go ahead and show them this display here. Here's how you guys broke down your answers. The answer, go ahead back. Uh, the answer is um, uh, C, a volatile. You know, so astronomers are, will, will say stuff like, well, there's all the volatiles have been pushed out from the inner part of the nebula, or this part of the nebula is rich in volatiles. And one of the volatiles uh, that they talk about is ammonia because it under certain conditions it becomes a gas which is why it attacks your nose and a few of you but actually less than half of you uh, got that one right and i want to address the other options for that reason um, if you answered a a biohazard uh, that would be good um, if and that's why i put the i wanted to see if anybody would key in on that photo up there of the biohazard suits in New York City. Uh, but you, you know, we don't even know that there's life on any other planet. So, um, and it's, you know, I don't think, I don't even think on our planet, ammonia is considered a, a biohazard. But, you know, they ship it around the country in big rail, uh, big tank cars on the railroad. And, but I don't think uh, ammonia, if it spills, is considered a biohazard. It's smelly, but it's not going to, you know, kill. I mean, unless you are right next to the train when it dumps, you know, so you, you could drown in ammonia, I guess, ammonia liquid. But, um, no. but now other stuff that they carry around on rail cars can be really bad. And so you don't want to be around when that happens, but not. Uh, okay, uh, a subset of nuclear radiation. No, that's. Uh, ammonia is a compound. It's not a kind of a radiation. Uh, noble gas, D. Uh, no, it's not, a, it's not a noble gas, uh, A, because um, it's not an element. The, the term noble gas applies to uh, elements like helium, neon, argon, xenon, everything on the right-hand side, the right-hand column of the periodic table. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it's not... You wouldn't even call it a noble compound. The reason that they call anything on the periodic table in the right column noble is it, is, it tends to not combine or socialize with other elements. So helium and neon, uh, argon, etc., they don't really bind with oxygen. So you don't see any helium oxide. You see hydrogen oxide, dihydrogen oxide. A matter, a matter of fact, Everyone in this room has abundant, copious amounts of dihydrogen oxide. They've discovered that. Because the other name for dihydrogen oxide is water. All right, so hydrogen binds with oxygen. Helium, no. Neon, no. It doesn't really bind with anything. But, you know, the reason, and here's another way that you can, kind of a back door on that. The reason that we know that it's a volatile and, it, and we would say that it's smelly or stinky or pungent in our nose is because it does react with the um, olfactory nerves in your nose. And it's used as a cleaning product because it binds with other substances that you're trying to clean. All right. It's not useful for everything, but for a lot of things, yes. So. So it's very reactive. It's not noble in, in the least. Okay. And nothing in particular. There are substances that we find in the world that don't have, you know, uh, you know kind of a, a nickname or a generic word for that category. Uh, but not ammonia. Ammonia has uh, uh, the, the, it's part of a, a group called volatiles. Another volatile uh, would be uh, methane, CH4. And there's a bunch of other ones. And the, the gist of this question for you, and this is what you should take down for your notes about ammonia. Uh, ammonia and all the volatiles are important for understanding the entire solar system, right? Because the presence or lack thereof 
tell us about the history of a certain planet or, mo or moon, comet, asteroid, presence of volatiles or lack thereof. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we always scan for. You know, like the, the famous um, Italian guys that were scanning for methane on Mars and found it. So uh, it's, it, it, in general, volatiles are something that we, we, we want to know all about uh, most of the time in the solar system and in other star systems. Question number two. Uh, so this is a recall question. Do you recall the elements that we said were most abundant in Earth's crust. Not the core of the Earth, but the crust of the Earth. Because the core of the Earth, that's iron and nickel, we think. But the crust is a little, there's a lot of iron everywhere in Earth, but in the crust, there's a bunch of other elements that are more abundant. Okay, uh, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, most of you got it. Uh, silicon and oxygen. Uh, definitely make a note of that as well. Uh, here's a, an image to help you remember silicon and oxygen. Uh, Sand, you know, there's sand all over this planet. A lot of the surface rocks, surface stones uh, are sandstone. And, and so uh, sand, sand is uh, silicon dioxide, SiO2. Um, neon and argon, not really. They're, they're present, but not in great amounts. Uh, hydrogen and helium uh, are present. Hydrogen in compounds. Uh, but not as a gas. Uranium and radium are pretty rare. Uh, gold, platinum, and iridium, uh, precious metals. Uh, although I don't know if iridium is considered a precious metal. Gold and platinum are. Uh, but iridium is considered pretty rare as well. It's, it's not found in a lot of places. Uh, and it has an interesting story when we get to talk about asteroids and stuff. Iridium has an interesting story tale to tell. Uh, but those are considered pretty rare in the crust of the earth. I mean, if those were the most abundant, we'd have things made out, well, we wouldn't have things made out of gold, but we'd have a lot of things that had gold in them. You can't make stuff with gold. You know, you can't make a bridge with gold. Uh, you can't make uh, a car with gold. It's not, it's not strong enough. It's not rigid enough. It's too, too ductile. You know, it's not, you know, your car would just it would come to you couldn't make a bridge, you know. It's platinum. I don't know. Platinum is a little harder, I guess. But all right. So this set, oxygen and silicon. Make a note. This is important for us because we're going to compare the outer planets to Earth because Earth is what we know a lot about. And so what we're going to find is that the composition of the outer planets, and as you'll read. Uh, when you go through homework four tonight, uh, the composition of the outer planets is way different from what we see in the crust. And, uh, and we've already kind of talked about it, but we'll talk about it some more. You'll read about it some more. Uh, compared to the abundances of the outer four planets. There's a couple nice tables. Uh, and uh, let's see, I believe the, uh, the very first section of chapter 11 Go ahead and make a note of that. Uh, I think it's called Thinking Ahead, the very first, you know, like the little blurb at the start of chapter 11. And I think in that section, or maybe the 11 one, there's a table uh, of abundances in the outer planets. It's kind of interesting to look at. All right. Now, here's a picture, figure one from chapter 12, uh, which is about the moons, the, uh, the outer moons and stuff. Uh, and uh, let's continue our discussion. We, we got to this slide last time. Let's start here for our main uh, discussion. Now, there's a bunch of moons. Um, 
in the solar system. There's an image over here. I have another image coming up. Um, there's several that are larger than 1,500 kilometers. Now, the moon is 1,738 kilometers, all right? And so uh, the moon is actually pretty big. And you can see over here in this diagram here, they, down here at the bottom, let's see. Uh oh, my cursor is not gigantic. Uh, here we go. Oh, man, my cursor is pathetic. Anyways, down here in the bottom rank, uh, of this image here, Mercury, Moon, and Pluto. And the other ones are drawn to scale. Uh, these are the, f at the very top, these are the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. They're the big ones. So you can see the moon is a little bit smaller than, than most of them. Uh, Saturn has a bunch here, most of them fairly small compared to the moon, but that yellowy one over there is Titan. Uh, that's an inner, we've, we've actually sent a lander uh, to Titan uh, recently to check it out. Um, here's Neptune. Triton is a, is a fairly big uh, moon uh, for Neptune, way out there. Anyway, so there's a bunch that are larger than 15. Uh, in the range 300 to 1,500 kilometers, we got a bunch. Some of them are listed here. And then the, th the thing that we've noticed about this bunch of moons, they all have the same angular momentum states uh, as the planets themselves, all right? Now, what I mean by that, take notes. I'm just going to go through this verbally. If you were to park yourself mm, about 100 astronomical units north of the sun, in other words, toward the North Star, and you get in your rocket ship and head towards the North Star, maybe 100 astronomical units, so you can look down and see everything, you know, and trace out the motions, all the planets would be going counterclockwise on their orbits. So make a note of that. All the planets orbit counterclockwise when viewed from the perspective of the North Star. Right, so north of the solar system. Second, all, almost all of the planets and the sun itself spin counterclockwise. So, so they're spinning as they uh, revolve around the sun, okay, like a, like a top. So they, you know, the Earth, Earth goes around the sun once every 365 days and it spins on its axis from Santa's workshop in the North Pole to the Happy Feet land down in Antarctica, that's the spin axis. South Pole to North Pole spins one time every 24 hours. Okay, so that's our spin <coughs> angular momentum state. And that, that spin axis defines the location of our pole star, Polaris, the North Star. All right, now most of the planets have spin axes pretty, that point pretty close to the North Star. All right, in that basically in the north direction, the sun as well. Now there's a couple exceptions, but most of them are, um, you know, within a, you know maybe 10, 20 degrees. You can look it up on the planetary data sheet. Okay. Now the moons, th this bunch of moons, the large ones and the mediums, also have the same spin, most of them, and orbit their planet counterclockwise as viewed from the moon. So we think um, that these things formed at the same time that their planet formed, these bigger ones, All right? So like Enceladus, uh, Io, the, you know, the Galilean moons. So when, the, when the Jupiter was forming, it formed from a kind of a big blob of gas and dust and um, that, that began to spin counterclockwise, when, and, but uh, a few little subclumps that were orbiting it, um, they solidified into moons, right? And so, the, and, and, and the planets are little teeny subclumps of the big blob that was spinning counterclockwise, and that's the sun. You know, the big blob of hydrogen and helium that formed the sun was spinning uh, counterclockwise when viewed from the North Star. All right, so this is a clue 
And so looking at this and measuring the rotation, uh, measuring the spin, uh, gives us a clue about the history of these moons. How did they form? Right now, the littler ones, less than about 300 kilometers, uh, not so fast. We've, their uh, orbits are all over the place. They don't have any particular pattern. The small ones, um, you know, like Saturn's rings um, are the same. They, you know, they're, they uh, orbit in counterclockwise manner. Um, it's moons, Saturn's moons orbit, the big ones. Um, and, uh, you know, so they're all on the same, approximately the same plane. So all these medium and big moons, all about the same orbital plane or fairly close to parallel with Earth and Earth's moon. Uh, the, the orbit of Venus and Mercury, Mars, the orbit of, you know, most of the other planets are, you know, it's not perfectly flat. You know, there's a little bit of tilt. You know, like the moon is, is not perfectly level and parallel with Earth's orbit. It's got a little bit of a tilt to it. Uh, but it's pretty close. All right. So this process of capturing asteroids and comets uh, and making little planets for, you know, mainly for Saturn and uh, Jupiter is called clearing, clearing the uh, solar system, central clearing, you know, those various phrases. You know, you could say that Jupiter and Saturn sweep the solar system of comets and asteroids. They're not done yet. Matter of fact, uh, what, what year was Shoemaker-Levy? That was 94, right? Shoemaker, there was a comet that we saw that Jupiter gobbled up. You know, it was spotted uh, by Gene Shoemaker and a guy named Levy, 92, uh, in the you know years before that, and it, and and they were observing this comet, and they figured that, uh oh, it's going to plow into the side of Jupiter. And we had a probe up there at the time uh, that could see it perfectly. You know, it was it was on the back side of the Jupiter. You know, when viewed from the Earth, but we had something up there that was could look right at it. Uh, anyways, that that impact, it, the, Jupiter broke apart the comet into fragments and then the, a rain of fragments. So you, you look at the image of Shoemaker, Shoemaker Levy impacting Jupiter, you see a bunch of basically uh, holes punched in the atmosphere of Jupiter, you know, big black blobs. And they also observed some really big, enormous flashes from the impact. So, uh, which is what we see here on Earth. I mean, when we, see, you know, certain um, uh, objects that, if they're big enough and they crash into Earth, they'll explode in the atmosphere. And they had one just recently over there in Siberia. Uh, I believe it's Chelyabinsk in Russia, and it blew windows out. It was it was high enough in the atmosphere that it did. I, I think. A few people got killed, but it didn't level any cities. But it blew a lot of windows out. If it had been a little bit lower, uh, when it exploded, it could have leveled a city. It was a pretty big explosion. But anyways, we saw something like that uh, on, on Jupiter with that impact. So that's the whole idea of clearing the solar nebula, clearing the inner solar system. You know, you look at the moon, and it's, it's loaded with craters. All right? Mars has got a lot of craters. All right, the different moons in the solar system that we see have got a lot of craters. All right, and especially the moon and, and Mercury. All right, so we know, but it's they're not getting any lately. There's not a whole lot of new ones. All right, so we know that in in the earlier part of the solar system, the solar system was blazing with comets and asteroids just flying around, and you know like a shooting gallery. And all that got cleared by Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune to some degree, all right? And that's an important feature of the, the outer planets. You know, Earth does the same thing. I mean, we, we, get, we take hits. The moon takes hits. Uh, but we're pretty small. We don't take as many as Jupiter. You know, the, Jupiter is a gas giant planet, right? So it doesn't have a, a, a surface where you're going to see craters uh, three billion years later like the moon does, all right? So uh, because of that, 
you know, we can't really say what we can't do crater counting on Jupiter, but if you could, man, it'd be loaded. You know, I mean, Jupiter's got a big atmosphere. It just, you know, swallows the stuff and just keeps on cooking. It's the small moon shape generally resembles potatoes. We'll talk more about asteroids and, and these moons and stuff uh, probably after exam two. We might get to it on Thursday, some asteroids. Um, so uh, let's, let's take another look. Here's, this is figure one from chapter 12, 12.1. And it's a comparison of the moons of Earth and up here toward the top left, you can see uh, our moon. And then Io, Jupiter's moon, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto in the second column. And then down, down in the lower right, you can see Earth for comparison. Uh, and there's uh, Pluto's got a moon, uh, Eris, apparently. Uh, those are... Uh, Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, Neptune's got a big. You, anyways, you can see all the. You know the the one that we're going to talk about is this little baby up here, Enceladus. Enceladus is, is it's hardly even a blip. But it's pretty interesting, and telling the story of Enceladus helps us tell the story of Saturn. So let's turn to Enceladus now, the one of the moons, one of the smaller ones that's orbiting Saturn. And we've taken a look at this before, and we've noticed geysering in the southern hemisphere, all right? Now, uh, let's start in terms of Saturn, so let's look at the planetary fact sheet uh, from NASA. And click on, the, if you click on the, the link for Saturn, here's the Saturn fact sheet. And, you know, it's got a little picture of Saturn, and, you know, here are the, you know, the basic specs. The Saturn itself, it's, you know, the mass of Saturn uh, is 568.34 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. That's a lot. That's basically, and it, it also tells you uh, the ratio between Saturn and Earth. So Saturn over here in the third column of figures, is about 95.16 times the mass of Earth, right? It's quite a bit bigger, though, uh, but you can see it's, uh, it's equatorial radius. The, the radii are about nine, nine, you know, depending, you know, it's, it's not a perfect uh, sphere, so equatorial radius around the equator is different from the polar radius around the north and south poles, but they're fairly close about nine times the, the radius of Earth. So um, now here's what we're going to take, take a look at. This is the interesting part. Uh, if you click a little bit lower down on the fact sheet, you can see uh, this is actually the bottom of the, the fact sheet for Saturn. Here's a close-up. Uh, you can see that the specs for the, set, uh, the atmosphere of Saturn, temperatures and density. It's kind of cool to just look at this. If you see there that the wind speeds, 400 meters per second is the max, they think. Um, and that's in the equatorial band from 30 degrees north longitude or north latitude to 30 degrees south latitude. 400 meters per second, that's maybe 900 miles an hour. Right, we haven't got anything like that, right? Uh, up to 150 m meters per second, that's about 300 and change miles per hour. And that's a little bit north of, uh, north of 30 degrees north latitude. Um, uh, mean molecular weight, that means it's a little bit heavier on average than helium, I guess is what that means. Uh, but atmospheric composition by volume, this is what we want. Okay, the major uh, compounds or the major um, uh, components of the uh, atmosphere, uh, molecular hydrogen, H2, that's, that's considered a, a molecule H2 binding together. 
uh, 96.3. So it's mostly, the atmosphere is mostly hydrogen. And then there's some helium, about 3.25. Let's see, what do those two add up to? 99.55%. Right, so that's most of the atmosphere. And you got um, minor components. And notice that these ones are not rated in percentage like hydrogen and helium. They're rated in parts per million ppm. All right, so methane, CH4, 4,500 ppm, 4,500 parts per million. That's a fairly good size percentage. I mean, well, relatively speaking, it's the biggest one. Uh, ammonia, NH3, 125 parts per million. So there's a lot of ammonia in the atmosphere, gaseous ammonia, gaseous methane. Uh, hydrogen deuteride, HD, that's a a form of heavy hydrogen, a molecular hydrogen. It's a hydrogen atom and a deuterium atom uh, bound together. 110 parts per million. Ethane, C2H6. Uh, ever heard of the term ethanol? Polyethylene, ethylene, you know, which we make, this is a hydrocarbon, C2H6. I have an image of it here in just a second. Uh, seven parts per million. So that's pretty small, it's, but we can see, it's enough that we can see it. Okay, now I want to um, uh, make sure you make a note of ethane. We're going to look at it. And then here's another word I want you to write down in your notes, aerosols. Now what that means is particles, an aerosol particle. And did you know that um, most of the rain that you experience here on this planet is formed around a very small aerosol particle. It could be ice, it could be um, smoke, it could be any, you know, any kind of a solid, very small particle, uh, dust, you know, dust in the atmosphere. Uh, so aerosol particles, ammonia ice, water ice, and ammonium hydrosulfide, all right? So that means that the clouds that we see, you're talking about ice. Isis. So these are like the cirrus clouds on Earth. You know, cirrus clouds are not water droplets. You know, the thunder clouds that you see, you know, the big fluffy white ones on a fair day, the big fluffy white ones that are angry and start dumping water and lightning and stuff. Hurricanes. Those are all, uh, those clouds are all micro droplets of water. And if they, if they condense, if, if they, um, if they combine together and make a big enough droplet, the air won't keep them aloft. They'll, they'll be big enough that they start to fall. And that's what we call rainfall. And out west, if you go out west in the summer and you see a you know, wide open space is Montana, the big sky, you see a thunderstorm 40 miles away, um, you can sometimes see the rain coming down and then it just, you know, from the bottom of the rain cloud, the thunder cloud, and then it just kind of disappears. You get, it's like, like a jellyfish tendrils, you know, the little things coming out of a jellyfish that float down into the ocean. You know, you see these, these streams of water coming down, but you know what happens? All that rain, it, it, it forms up in the thundercloud big enough to start falling, but then on the way to the ground, the air out there is so dry that it just evaporates. And it, it heads for the ground, but never makes it. All right. Uh, so that's... But above that, all those rain clouds, liquid water droplets, are cirrus clouds, and those are ice. Those are clouds made of ice. You know, so if the water uh, gets blazed up there to certain, um, certain altitudes, it'll, and the pressure and temperature are right, time of day is right, it'll form cirrus clouds. Also, in, in terms of aerosols, when you see a, a jet going across the sky and leaving a contrail, you know, it looks like a cloud. It is a cloud. And it's water droplets. And they're forming around the aerosol particles from the jet engines, right? And the temperature and pressure, uh, you know, uh, perturbations that occur when the plane goes through there, dumps some aerosol particles out the exhaust, uh, and then those, if the conditions are right, those aerosol particles 
will form a contrail. Sometimes the conditions aren't right, you can't see it. You know, but, um, you know, at the right altitude, yeah. So aerosol particles. Now here's a picture of ethane. Go ahead and make a sketch of this. This is the structural formula. Two carbons, six hydrogens. So the carbons are bonded together. And then they also bond with three hydrogens. You know, kind of like oxygen and H2O. The oxygen bonds to two hydrogens, right? And then it, it's a stable compound. And this is a stable compound. You know where we find it? You know, we can see it up there in the, in the outer planets. You know, the spectral thing, the quantum fingerprints. We know what it is. You know why? Because we see ethane here on Earth. And you know where we see it? Natural gas. I mean, Earth contains a lot of ethane in natural gas. So, so when, you, when you have, you know, like uh, you're fracking some, some natural gas up out of the ground or wherever you're getting it, a lot of times the refinery, they, they, you know, they won't make it into fuel or liquid natural gas. They'll refine it into various hydrocarbon fractions. And this is one, and this is, uh, one of the fractions that they use to manufacture polyethylene plastic. And you can make ethanol from this. Ethanol is the alcohol that is consumable by humanoids who consume adult beverages and by cars that consume ethanol gasoline, ethanol contaminated gasoline. Uh, here's, a, here's a 3D picture of ethane. This is the, it's, so it's not perfectly symmetric. I mean, this one, this one is perfectly symmetric. And that's kind of a... a uh, like a schematic diagram. This is a, what we think it actually looks like. Well, without the sticks. The sticks are meant to symbolize bonds, but the, the basic structure. So you can see it's not perfectly, that one, the set of three, you've got kind of two tetrahedrons there, two little pyramids. The top of each pyramid is a carbon, a gray carbon molecule, but they're twisted. They're not, you know, the, there's a little bit of twist. You look at that carefully. Anyway, so that's ethane. We, you know, they, they, we see all kinds of compounds up there. But that's one of the particular ones that's abundant in Saturn. So uh, let's talk about Enceladus and Saturn. And how do we observe those? Well, we got this. UCF strikes again. The Cassini spacecraft that recently terminated itself or that we recently terminated oh my goodness what a machine that thing was what a spacecraft it was um, our own professor colwell uh, at ucf up on the fourth floor uh, he's considered a world expert on the saturn and the cassini mission he's one of those scientists uh, in that um, and he teaches astronomy sometimes. And Physics 2053 is what he's got this semester. But um, he wrote a, a lovely book about the Cassini mission in Saturn. And the Cassini, here's the spacecraft. Uh, it, it contained a probe that we dropped onto the moon Titan. And it's kind of hard to see over here. It's, it's over here, especially because I don't have a big cursor, but... Over here on the right side, you're kind of looking uh, at an angle at a kind of a yellowy orange disc. And it says Huygens Titan Probe. Uh, when you look at it in, in uh, YouTube, you'll see it pretty clearly. Um, and, you know, they, they've got the, the arm out here. Uh, that's where they put the... Uh, uh, you know, a bunch of instruments on uh, this uh, antenna. I guess that's a transmitter as well as a receiver. Um, so that thing was launched in 97. Uh, and uh, September 15th, 2017, so just last September, they dropped it into uh, the outer layers of Saturn. One last uh, view Saturn because it was out of fuel and, and they, you know they were you know, they wanted to put it at a place that they wanted to probe 
Uh, so they kept a little bit of fuel left for that maneuver. Um, and Cassini, if, if all you got to do is type in Cassini and Saturn in Google, and then, oh my goodness, there are so many ex extremely gorgeous, exciting, cool photos from Cassini. I don't, you know, nothing else like it. And everything else is a potser compared to Cassini. Look at that. That's, that's looking at, you know, so Cassini's way up there, heading up towards the North Star, I'm guessing. Right? And he's, he's, you can't really see it, but right up here, oh man, where's my, you can't even see my cursor. Anyways, there it is. Right up here, you can see it kind of a bluish greenish circle up there, and on YouTube it'll be a little clearer. Or if you look at Cassini photos, you'll see it. Uh, that's the, uh, I think that's the North Pole. Right, so we're heading towards the North Star on this orbit of Cassini. We're looking back down. Or it could be the South Pole. Uh, and we're, you know, looking at Jupiter or Saturn and in the direction of uh, the North Star. Here's another picture. I mean, we'd like to have photos of that resolution uh, here on Earth. I mean, if somebody, you know, you, if you get the best Carl Zeiss lens and the best Nikon, uh, the best uh, contacts camera or Hasselblad camera, maybe you can get images of this resolution. Here's a figure from your book, 11.1. .1. See that little arrow down there? It's Earth. It's pointing to Earth. That's Earth. Viewed from Cassini. Little dot. Nice. Tiny, but nice. <coughs> All right. Now, let's talk about Enceladus. It's got these weird stripes down there in the southern hemisphere. You know, it looks like a tiger. Almost. Tiger stripes. The size of it is pretty small. It's, it's not ginormous. Roughly, you know, roughly the size of Florida, although not the same shape. So Jacksonville down in Miami is basically what you're talking about. All right, so make a note of that. And so it is, that's big compared to us. All right. And if it ever, if we ever had an impactor on Earth compared of this size, it would be pretty bad for us. But for the solar system... This thing's a little, a little blip. Now let's take a look. Here's a, now I want you to look at this carefully. I'm gonna click this and it's going to, let's see if I can get my cursor here. Come on, baby. And it's gonna start playing. Now watch it carefully. We'll try to do this again. See that stuff coming out? All right. Let's try it again. Here it comes. Southern Hemisphere, the bottom part. See it? Oh, my goodness. Can you believe it? It's water. It's fingerprints, quantum fingerprints. It's water. We love that. Anytime we see water, we're thinking, oh, maybe there's something alive there. But Enceladus, maybe. But at least it's got water, liquid water. Question. So like as a, as like a, like a sun is there, like test the water? Uh, they'd like to. They, you know what they did? The, the, the probe that they sent was to tighten the big one. And they were looking for conditions of life there. But I don't know if Titan's, Titan, as I recall, is loaded with uh, methane and gases like that, that, you know, are not a lot of water. And so it, but Enceladus definitely is. Uh, so let's talk some more about Enceladus. Uh, as I mentioned, Jacksonville to Miami, basically, uh, for the diameter. Uh, here's what we think the core uh, is, is like. And the H2O geysering is down here. 
And what they think, and you know, they'd love to put a probe on, you know, if they had like infinity dollars, they'd put probes on all these moons that we've been talking about. And the moons are, you know, in the outer solar system, there's no life in Jupiter, there's no life on Saturn, there's no life on Neptune or Uranus, um, unless it's a science fiction novel. But the moons, yeah, there's some chances out there, you know. And you know why? Because, you know, you may think, oh, Dr. B, it's got to be cold out there. It is. It's far, way far away from Earth. You know, Neptune has got one nine hundredth, you know, the strength of the sunshine in, in Neptune is one nine hundredth of what, you know, the strength is here. So we get about um, 1,300 and, and change uh, watts per square meter. On Nep, you know, from the sun. On Neptune, it's down to one point something watt per square meter, right? But here on Earth, we know that in very difficult conditions, like in volcanic vents under the sea, where there's an enormous concentration of uh, sulfur, I think it's sulfuric acid in the water, you know, right close to these vents, there are bacteria. There's life down there. Uh, Matter of fact, there was a science fiction movie. Uh, I don't know if it was Paycheck or something where somebody went into the future or came back from the past in a time machine so that Earth, so that we wouldn't mine the ocean vents because in the future they discovered that uh, a cure for cancer or something like that was found in those oceanic vents. And there's life down there. So we figure, you know, it's not all a better road. It's, you know, I never promised you a rose garden. You know, that old time song from, the, from back in the days. Uh, it's not a rose. I mean, life doesn't have to re require a rose garden. If it can live in a thermal vent, you know, 2,000 meters below the surface of the, the ocean, boy, we're, we're going to look for it anywhere we can find it. So, yeah, H2O geysering. So what they think we've got is a rocky core, okay, you know, like, you know, many of the moons, and then an icy crust, and they think that the crust is water ice, and it's subject to all kinds of folding. You know, that's where those tiger stripes are from. But underneath there they think there's a, a, an ocean of water, and that's where the geysers come from. You know, fractures in the southern hemisphere that permit hot water to geyser out, just like up in Yellowstone, you know, Old Faithful. You know, it's a third, we call it geothermal. Well, this would be an enceladothermal feature down there. There we see those geysers. Now, here's the theory of it. They think that the, the combination of orbital period and a little bit of eccentricity in the orbit of uh, Enceladus um, leads to it having, you know, close and far, close and far uh, from, from Saturn, All right? So, um, you know, he, Mercury is really uh, elliptical. And we know that Mercury gets, because it's so hot, it gets, a, I mean, because it's so close, it gets a lot of heat, all right? And so, but for Enceladus, its orbital feature is we think that it flexes under the tidal forces or the, the changes in the tidal forces uh, from Saturn itself. Now, if you, if you want to know why that is, just think about the tides on our planet, you know, our planet is, where's the session? Oh, you did it? Yeah. Oh, that's not L12, this is L13. Yeah, those are out of order, bud. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Tides on Earth. You know, we can, we can measure the Earth flexing because of the gravitational interaction, the tidal interaction with the moon. And everybody's here, well, probably everybody's here seen high tide and low tide. 
The oceans of earth on the surface, they're not nailed down, they're not rigid, it's a fluid, it's a liquid. So if it gets a tidal, um, and, and basically a tidal force is anywhere you have an extended object and you've got a little bit more gravity on one side of it than on the other side, or one end of it than on the other end. And so the close end that gets a little bit more gravitational force uh, races toward the moon. And the back end loses the race. It's going towards, it's falling towards the moon as well, but it loses the race. So it, it tends to be left in the dust. And that's why there's two high tides, one on the side of Earth, approximately underneath the moon, and one on the other side of the Earth, away from that side of the moon, or of Earth. Okay, so the, we can see these tidal deformations in the fluid oceans of Earth. All right, it's very obvious. And we can actually, it's, it's hard to see the earth flexing, but we can measure it. We have measured it, okay? So the earth flexes, it's a rock, basically, you know? And, you know, it's got a lot of molten lava and stuff, so it's got a little bit of give, but it's still pretty solid. So it doesn't, move, it doesn't flex a whole lot, but we can measure it. We can even measure the tidal, the size of the tidal interaction with the sun, you know, from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth. And that's why when the sun and the moon are lined up, you have big high tides and deep low tides, okay, when they're lined up. And uh, so we, you know, we can measure how much of a high tide is from the SUN. Most of it's from the moon, but a good fraction that we can measure is from the SUN. And we can see the earth flexing. And that's what we think is happening with Enceladus. You know, just as the earth flexes, we think that Enceladus is being flexed and, you know, what, what happens is, you know, so it's, it's not just like, um, like this. It's like taking your hands and, you know, rubbing them together, flexing, generates heat, a little bit of friction. And enough to blaze those geysers out at the southern pole that we see here. All right, so, and this is one moon. And we know this because of Cassini, Dr. Colwell. Oh boy, there's a lot to learn. And it's a lot of cool stuff. And, uh, you know, we'd like to put some probes up there, land, maybe you guys, or your grandchildren probably, We'll be on the first mission to Enceladus to check out the ice and those geysers in the southern part of Enceladus. That would be, that would be really, really interesting. All right, you're dismissed. Homework four activates in just a few minutes. Due on Thursday. See you then.